Hi, everyone. Welcome to Brooks River in Katmai National Park, Alaska. Glad to have you along for the ride today. This is a live play-by-play -play brought to you by Explore.org, Katmai National Park, and the Katmai Conservancy. My name is Mike Fitz with Explore.org. I'm the resident naturalist here for this wonderful website and co-hosting this play-by-play -play today on July 20, 2023 is Katmai National Park Ranger Naomi Boak. Naomi, how are you today? I'm well. It's um, good to see fish jumping at the fall. So uh, looking forward to this play-by-play. -play. Yeah, yesterday was the the first day we saw like a big surge of salmon moving into the into the river, and it looks like um, things have slowed just a little bit today, but not much. It seems like the bears are pretty well fed overall. And this is live footage that you're looking at Brooks Falls. Uh, right now, this is one of the best places in the world to watch brown bears fishing for salmon. We don't know exactly what we're going to see during the broadcast over the next hour, but we're going to narrate the bear activity, the salmon activity, and help you have a, a better wildlife watching experience through the cams. Uh, we have different cameras at our disposal today. So this is the main Brooks Falls camera uh, attached to the wildlife viewing platform at Brooks Falls. We have the Falls Low Cam, which gives a bear's eye view of the waterfall. Uh, just downstream of there is the Riffles. Uh, and then farther downstream, maybe about like a half mile or so, three quarters of a mile, is the uh, River Watch camera. And then we also have the Cats River View cam there. Also, the underwater camera available to us. Finally, if we want a, a mountaintop view, if the clouds do part, maybe we'll head up to Dumpling Mountain and check things out there, but it's pretty foggy up on top of the mountain today. Naomi, I like all of the cameras. I have actually never asked you if you have a favorite. Um, I love all the cameras. It's just like, I like being at the falls and I like being on the lower river. Um, you know, it, Dumpling Mountain can be spectacular. Um, I do like the Riffles cam a lot because it gives us some interesting views of both the falls and the activity at the riffles? Yeah, they each provide a really unique perspective on the river and great wildlife watching opportunities. So I also know that people are often tuning into the bear camps for the first time, maybe today, maybe yesterday, maybe recently. So let's take a quick tour as I always like to do to introduce you to the locations. Uh, Brooks Falls and Brooks River is located in Katmai National Park, Alaska, about 300 miles southwest of Anchorage. Brooks River is only about a mile and a half long, so about three kilometers. It's bisected by Brooks Falls. And along with our webcam partners, the, the National Park Service, Explored.org hosts and maintains several webcams along the river. The signal from those webcams is either uplinked directly through satellite internet or it's uh, skipped over Dumpling Mountain using a couple of radio repeaters and then sent to the small town of King Salmon about 30 miles away. So that's how we get the internet signal out of Brooks River. Uh, going back to the river itself though, this is what, uh, or this is the lower half of Brooks River. So the bottom half of the river, this is where the cameras are located. We'll talk about each one of these um, in brief here. Let's go to some more updated satellite imagery though. So this is just a plain view of the river itself. Uh, starting with the Brooks Falls camera, it's on, gonna be on the left-hand side of the image there attached to a wildlife viewing platform. It has a really great line of sight over the waterfall itself, but occasionally it will pan downstream. So that area outlined in yellow is roughly the line of sight for the Brooks Falls camera. Downstream, Naomi mentioned how the Riffles camera really gives a, a great perspective on the river itself, and I enjoy watching that one as well. Mostly focuses on the river right in front of the camera, but it can look back up towards Brooks Falls too. Then we have farther downstream near the river mouth, what we call the River Watch camera. This one looks mostly kind of upstream from the bridge over the mouth of Brooks River. So this is a, a wide area where you can see many different bears not concentrated into a particular spot, but spread across the river and the marshes there. Nearby attached to the floating bridge and pointed downstream is the underwater camera. So this is a view of the underwater camera itself. It's on the, the bridge over Brooks River pointed downstream. Then finally, we have uh, the Cats Riverview camera named after our, in honor of our longtime lead camera operator, uh, Camop Cat. 
And this one gives us a really great perspective on the river mouth itself. So with all of those combined, we have many different views of Brooks River to enjoy today. And I think we're going to try to utilize all of the cameras as best as we can. We also are going to answer some viewer questions that were submitted in advance through Ask Your Bear Cam question. You can find a link to that in the featured comment if you're watching on explore.org right now, or you can ask a moderator for the link to that form if you want to ask us any questions about any of our uh, live chats. So let's get back to the river, Naomi. I guess we'll start at Brooks Falls because, yeah, like I mentioned, past couple of days have really been the first days where we've seen large numbers of salmon at the river and bears getting well fed. And this is uh, a, an interesting bear to watch no matter how, how many salmon are in the river. <laughs> really big guy here, the most dominant bear in the river, 856. Yeah, um, interesting to see him over um, coming from the office now into what we call the conveyor belt. He usually likes the jacuzzi. And he's a he's such a dominant bear. And again, he doesn't have a nickname. He's only identified by his uh, assigned identification number, 856. And But he is so dominant, he can fish anywhere he wants to. But yeah, like you said, Naomi, he likes to fish in just a few spots. So the jacuzzi is one of them. And I think he's been finding a lot of success there. Sometimes I wonder when the fishing is really good, though, if they just want to change things up because they're not pressured, you know, to, to fill their stomach. Um, like they like maybe those hunger pangs are at least temporarily satisfied. Um, so maybe they're like, oh, yeah, maybe I'll try something different for a change and still find success. Yeah, well, he certainly can fish anywhere he wants to, and uh, he did catch a fish over there, so who can argue with that? You can see on the, the left side of the screen a much um, smaller bear, younger bear, moving out of our line of sight. So one of the things that I love watching at Brooks Falls is how bears interact with one another. Naomi, Naomi and I had a live chat yesterday about the bear hierarchy specifically, and how bears are interacting within that hierarchy and how it confers advantages to them and how they communicate to one another. So when you see a bear like 856 start to move around, watch for how other bears react because they will almost always just get right out of his, his line of travel. They do not want to tangle with him because he is so dominant. And then also, Naomi, that bear on the, on the lip of the falls... Start. Right, yeah, not very, not very concerned. The bear in the lip of the falls, he doesn't seem to be very hungry to me, just based on how nonchalant he is about those jumping salmon. Yeah, and and also eight five six is not concerned about that bear. I mean, in in the past week or so, he's really been very forceful in pushing out bears that he thinks might be competition for him, but he's okay with this bear. Now, while these bears are basically watching fish, <laughs> they'll be, they are fishing, but <laughs> oh, again, I mean, you can just see how, how casual and relaxed they are. Um, that bear, you know, was just waiting for a salmon to jump into its face, was not interested in even moving its body. Uh, so this again, indicates a really well-fed bear. It'd be interesting to see Naomi, how, um, how much of the fish this bear happens to eat. Uh, because that will also tell us how many meals it's had today. Right. There have been a lot of fish parts, fish fillets around on what was the island. When bears are really yeah. well fed. Look out, they casual. Will, they, yeah, extremely casual. When bears are really well fed, they're, they're not going to eat the whole fish typically. So they're going to eat the fattiest parts of the fish. And that on a salmon is the skin, the brain, and the eggs, if it's a, it's a female. So there, and also just like the pace of how slowly this bear is eating the salmon indicates that it hasn't, uh, it doesn't have a, maybe a lot of stomach capacity uh, right now. Good to see, right? People have been worried about, about the bears and if they're getting enough to eat. Yeah, the early part of summer, I think was, kind of tough for a lot of the bears because there weren't a lot of fish around. Bears were expecting fish. They, they were being as patient as they could, essentially. 
but they weren't getting that hunger satisfied. Um, but the, for the bears that have stuck around Brooks River, the, their patience has really paid off the past couple of days. And it's um, it's it's one of those one of those days where I think every bear is is getting what it what it wants and what it what it needs, although in different ways. Enjoying its meal slowly. And it doesn't have to eat to fast see. as well because there's no other bears around, right? I mean, 856 is not paying attention and um, there's not, doesn't seem to be competition on the lip. So it doesn't have to run away with that fish or gobble it down so another bear doesn't have to get it. Yeah, that's another important consideration for brown bears is, is whether or not it can finish its meal before another bear is going to show up and try to take it away. Uh, so bears will steal from one another uh, from time to time. Oh, look at that. Definitely did, yep, de definitely did not eat all of that, um, that, that salmon. So that'll, be, that'll drift downstream, and that'll be available to bears who are using, um, you know, maybe the Riffles area or downstream in the lower river, in fact. So let's let's head down to our river watch camera right now because there are bears spread out in this vicinity. Basically, they are looking to scavenge dead salmon, maybe salmon that swam upstream and they got injured because uh, there was like the density of fish yesterday was just so high. Not all of them probably made it um, over the waterfall if they wanted to. Maybe they knocked themselves silly. Maybe they got injured and couldn't swim upstream. And a lot of these uh, bears, I think also, Naomi, are just scavenging leftover salmon that have drifted downstream. Yeah, I, we've seen a lot of um, bears eating on the on the lower river. And and having all those parts left over, I mean, it, it feeds um, birds and 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 other uh, other creatures. But it's also feeding, um, as we spoke ab about yesterday, subadults bears lower on the hierarchy, and maybe some um, family groups that aren't confident enough to go up to the falls. There's, so yeah, there's, there's big guys maybe that are high grading up at the waterfall. And that's that behavior that we saw with um, the bear on the lip before, since it's not wasn't eating the whole fish and was selecting for the fattier parts. That high grading behavior can facilitate access uh, to salmon for other bears, maybe who aren't fishing on the lip or maybe can't compete for fishing spots up at Brooks Falls. And as we were talking about before, just before we go back to the falls, um, there, were, um, uh, there were some cubs down there. Yeah, I was wondering if we were looking at uh, a family group on the cams just a moment ago uh, there have been yeah. a bunch of families in this area so if you're looking to see moms and cubs they will go to the falls a lot of times though i think we're seeing them more often on the um the river watch camera and um, cats view camera so if you want to see family groups check out all of the cams but definitely check out the cams at the at the mouth of brooks river oh and a diving pair yeah the, yeah Oh, nice. We don't see that very often. No, it was okay. It was under for so long. I was like, did I, did, <laughs> was my, did I take what I, I saw, what I thought I saw? Uh, yeah, we don't see bears diving that much. Um, often they don't like to get their feet wet. So that one was under the water, maybe swimming quite a ways down to pick up a, a salmon carcass. So diving is a, a learned skill. Bears have instincts to, of course, find and eat uh, nutritious food, but fishing is a learned skill, something that they have to practice to get good at. Diving is one of those things that not a, a lot of bears will do, uh, but I think that was a really great example, and that was a, kind of a long dive for a brown bear. I think the family group is out of sight now. They were kind of climbing into the bushes there. Oh, yeah, that looks like again. that's the case. Oh, another diver. Yep. So there's that's a part of the river that has changed. 
a lot in recent years. It's gotten much deeper. It's part of the, really the main river channel now when it didn't used to be. So maybe there's a deep pocket of water there uh, that's just a little bit too deep for the bear to grab a salmon with its, with its sort of like hind feet and pick it up uh, to the surface, which sometimes they'll do if they can stand on the bottom of the water. So interesting to see um, that, that diving behavior in that spot. This is a, that'll be an area to watch later in the summer, Naomi, when, when more bears are fishing on dead and dying salmon after the salmon are done spawning. Yeah. Those two bears are being pretty successful. And I'm told by our camera operators that the bears at the falls are finding a lot of success as well. Uh, bear going for dive number three in just the last uh, couple of minutes here. So again, uh, positive reinforcement forces bears to try things over or encourages, I should say, um, bears to try things over and over and over again. So if that bear is diving here right now, we might, and that bear comes back in September and October, we might see that bear doing the same thing in that spot. And that's why bears go back to the same fishing spots, uh, you know, at this time of the year, day after day and across years. Um, and I'm told by our camera operators and they have uh, a view that's maybe about a minute or so ahead of what we are seeing that um, the bear on the lip has caught his third fish uh, for the day uh, so far. So I think we're going to get to see that in, um, in just a minute. Times like this that I always wonder what eight five. He's over there not catching, and there's this younger bear on the lip catching fish. Maybe he'll tell us one day. I wonder if bears find some sort of or a a sense of comfort by sitting in the river surrounded by food. When because you know you'll see that sometimes, like you said, Naomi, you see a bear go into the water, and they'll be surrounded by fish, but they're not just eating; uh, they're they're sort of just sitting there. I think they have an instinct to catch vulnerable prey, um, even if their stomach is full, because they live in a world of feast and famine. Right? They they don't know if the salmon are going to be abundant tomorrow, so they got to take advantage of the opportunity. But believe it or not, they only have so much room in their stomach for food. So maybe if they are full. Um, they're just sort of like waiting for some stomach capacity to open up as they digest um, what's in there already. But uh, I also think, yeah, maybe it's just like a good feeling for them to, to have that level of comfort um, and security in the sense, food security, by being surrounded by food. I, I think bears are emotional creatures, um, probably like, you know, like domestic dogs in that sense. Uh, but it really doesn't seem to be well studied or, or studied at all. Um, and they don't have like the facial, you know, muscles to really kind of communicate what we would describe as emotions in dogs. Dogs have a, um, a much easier time expressing things by, you know, curling their lips or something like that. And bears really can't do that. So it's maybe a little bit harder to tease out their moods. That bear is not going to finish this fish. No, definitely taking its time. Uh, ate more of the flesh than the la the first one that we watched. I also think sometimes, you know, <laughs> some salmon probably taste better than others. Uh, when the bears are really hungry, though, they're going to eat the entire thing. Uh, even the entrails sometimes, which don't seem to be preferred much of the time. But if they are really hungry, they're going to eat the whole thing. Even um, the the mandibles and the gill plates, which you know I, I, a person could not chew and swallow. I don't I don't see how that would be possible. But a bear can put that down through their stomach; it'll pass right through, and out the other side. It doesn't seem to cause them really any any harm or or um, any any discomfort. Well, they, they do have discriminating tastes. I mean, they don't seem to like trout. They um, 
seem to prefer Sakai and Silvers over um, Chum. Yeah, and they'll take what they can get for sure, but they do have discriminating taste. And I know our camera operators are talking about how um, some of the cameras are freezing from time to time. Um, so we'll be cutting back and forth uh, as the internet catches up with things. It's not something that we can necessarily um, control. But we do have maybe a family group at the, at the river mouth of our frozen image. We'll see if that happens to catch back up here. So I'm hoping that's the case. Let me toggle in between settings here. Still frozen. Right, but uh, um, so yeah, we'll we'll uh, we'll cut back to this once it's unfrozen, folks. Oh, there it is. All right, thanks All for right, your patience and sticking with this. Yeah, so this looks like um, a mother bear with um, looks like a couple of yearlings on the bank. Naomi, do you think that's number? I don't know if that's number ninety four or eight two or four eight two. Yeah, that's another good possibility. Uh, she has those light number four eight two. And those big floofy, floofy cubs. Yeah, yeah. Maybe this is um, four eight two. Um, just uh, you know, her mane is a little wetted right now, so it's not as as puffy. And I haven't really had a great chance to to watch her this year, but she has some pretty small two and a half year olds uh, this year. And compared to the the two and a half year old with number nine, 10, you'll see, I think, a, a, a marked difference in family size if we ever see them sort of in the same frame. Yeah, when I first saw those cubs, I, th I thought they were yearlings. They, they, they are very small. They look great, but they're very small. Mother bears and cat might usually keep their cubs for two to three summers before separating from them in the following spring. So we can, I think, expect number 482 here to separate from her cubs uh, next fall. So they got another year of lessons um, with mom, another year to absorb her, her wisdom. And we've seen the benefits of that for a uh, great day. I mean, one of them was on the lip this morning and doing really well. It's fun to watch family groups because the, the, the cubs are sponges uh, for information, especially what their mother does. They're, they're very in tune with their mother's um, level of stress and her attitude. If mom is feeling big and bold, then they're going to feel bold if mom is feeling stressed out and skittish, then they're going to react in the same way. If mom is interested in something and curious, they're going to react in the same way. Uh, and we'll often see them exploring things that they would otherwise ignore because uh, mom shows showed interest in it. Yesterday, I watched um, Divot's cub mimic her when Divot went bent down to get some water. And and the cub did the same thing. It was it was such so clear it was mimicking mom. Things are starting to clear up on Dumpling Mountain too. So people are wondering where the salmon go once they jump Brooks Falls. Many of them will spawn in the upper part of Brooks River, but that's really only about three quarters of a mile of stream. So, you know, maybe a kilometer and a half or so. Most of them are going to go uh, into Lake Brooks and the tributaries off of Lake Brooks. So while we have that quick view, I wanted to show you that, but I also don't want to miss this. Mom swimming across oh the river goodness. with a cub on her back. Oh, great. This is a first year cub. So contrast the uh, size in the color of this cub who's on the left hand side with its mother with those small two and a half year olds that you saw on the far, um, on the far bank. The distance between them is actually larger than what it seems like on the cameras. 
So that's going to distort things. Those two and a half year olds are going to look even smaller than they are based on the distance. But um, spring cubs at this time of the year, first year cubs, they're going to be very small compared to other bears. They're also going to be almost uniformly dark. Sometimes they'll have a light collar of fur around their neck or so, but they're going to be extremely small and dark at this time of the year. So this is a first year cub on mom's back does not want to swim in the water, <laughs> Naomi. No, it's clinging, clinging to her. <laughs> Since they're designed like like dogs and, and wolves, they're they're pretty well set up for swimming. They float really well. They can doggy paddle to get um, from one place to another. They their nostrils sit above the water when they're when they are swimming and that's different than in people like if we lay in the water and we don't move we lay face down usually <laughs> uh so you know we're you know we can drown pretty easy unless we learn how to swim but since uh, since bears are, are designed a bit a little bit differently it's much easier for them to swim in the water although it can be difficult for for cubs the water's cold they have to expend more energy proportionally than mom to move through the water so that's why i think sometimes you see um, cubs trying so hard to get onto mother's back. I mean, I, I think you also see that reaction to the cold temperature. Oh, look, she doesn't want that cub on her back. And their claws, their claws are sharp. This, this, um, cubs at this time of the year are pretty good at climbing trees. They may weigh 30 or 40 pounds, some of the bigger ones. So you can imagine, a, um, you know, a cub with, uh, you know, half inch long claws or something like that, trying to climb onto your back. And even though you have maybe the fur of a bear, it's probably not all that, all that comfortable. That's one determined cub though. There it goes. <laughs> Much of the time mothers are, you know, focused on, on foraging and fishing and they very much care for their their offspring's welfare. A lot of the time though, the cubs are, are kind of forced to keep up with mom. Um, mom needs to, needs to find food. She needs to forage. The cub needs to keep up. Uh, mo mother bears will adjust their behavior depending on, you know, whether their cubs are injured or healthy or something like that. But if, if mother determines, Hey, that the cub is, is, is capable of it. She's like, Hey, you're just going to have to follow me. So one of the interesting things to watch for when you're looking at brown bears is how the behavior of mothers varies, not only from family to family, but also just depending on, on the status of, and the health of the cub itself. Yeah. I mean, you saw that very clearly with Holly when um, her now sub-adult 335 had um, porcupine quills in its paw. She didn't go very far. Um, she, she limited her range. But this mom is saying, Cub, you better, you better keep up with me because she's looking for food. Yeah, great work by our camera operator here to follow this family through the grass. Looks like maybe they're going to move out of our line of sight here in, in just a moment, uh, at least for this camera. Maybe this family will pop up um, downstream a little bit later on. Plenty of cover for them to rest and and hide in the forest um, nearby if, if they want to. Just another example of how great the bear watching is on the lower river. I mean, people come to the Brooks River to go to the falls, but um, the, the bear watching can be just as great on the lower river. So while our family moves out of our line of sight here, let's um, head back up to the falls, check out what two of the more dominant bears on the river are up to. Again, number 856, we had introduced him at the beginning of the broadcast, the river's most dominant bear so far this summer. Those blonde ears um, and sort of like reddish brown fur. So he's the big guy in the foreground. It looks like number 128 uh, Grazer is in the background there. And I think, Naomi, she is the best angler on the river. She can catch fish anywhere. Yeah. Yeah, she is good. Grazer is, is a, a mature adult female. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure that is her. She's just kind of wet 
looks a little bit smaller than she is, I think, just with A5-6 in the foreground. Uh, so Grazer, yeah, mature adult female. She was born in 2005, if I remember correctly. She's had a couple of litters. And for a female, um, she is quite dominant. There's not really many bears that will tangle with her. And usually it's only like the real big guys that, um, that she'll yield to. She, you know, I, we've seen her not yield to eight, five, six, and look at that size differential. When she, when she attacked him, when she had cubs, <laughs> I could only read the look on his face. It's like, what is happening? What is she doing? Yeah, she's, she's but, a fierce mom uh, when, when she's defending her cubs. And she's uh, forced to be reckoned with when, um, when she's not with cubs. And I, and I cut to the Riffles camera here. Off in the distance at the, on the right side of the falls, you can see where Grazer and 856 are fishing. They kind of just look like spots, but they're separated probably by about, um, you know, maybe... 40 or 50 feet. So sometimes the perspective that of the falls cam is um, a little deceiving. They look um, pretty close in this view, but there's, they are separated by um, space. So divot, or excuse me, um, Grazer certainly has space to move around a five, six if she chooses. You know, I, watching 856 this year, he, you know, we always know how tall he is, but all these years with all all this salmon, so early in the season, he, he really shows his size. He is so big. Oh, yeah, he's huge. He's, um, you know, standing on all, all fours. That shoulder hump is five feet off of the ground. So 856 is a giant of a bear. And he's willing to throw his weight around. He's he's not shy about it. And that was one thing why he is so dominant. Um, I think since Naomi, we we were looking at Grazer. I, th I think that might be her again. Still on the on the far wall there. I make mistakes in the play by plays with my IDs because my video feed isn't like the crisp 1080p that maybe people are watching at home with. But anyway, I apologize I if I do get any of those those IDs wrong. Um, but we'll, uh, we'll keep an eye on that bear for a moment. But I did want to talk about something that happened earlier today with 128's um, recently separated offspring. So this is the pair of them. Naomi, I think this is your photo, right, from earlier this summer? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, yes. Grazer we had two. The belly road. Yeah. yeah, they had, uh, so she had... Um, in the springtime, she still had her cubs. She separated from them. So now they're living a life of independence. We saw one of them earlier today um, on the lip of Brooks Falls. So that's um, on the left side of the screen, two bears on the top of the waterfall. And um, the one that's nearest to the camera on the lip of the falls uh, is one of Grazer's uh, one of Grazer's offspring. And let's see, why did that freeze in the moment? I'll try to get that back. You're being so fancy, Mike. That's the problem. Yeah, there I don't go. think it's me being fancy. Um, <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> watch what happens when, um, so Grazer was fishing in the jacuzzi at the beginning of this clip. Now she's moving off the bottom of the screen. She's gonna circle around to the lip of the waterfall. A lot of times people wonder like what happens when a mother or her former cubs and i think we're gonna uh, and this is just a really great example it's just one data point but i think it really demonstrates um, something important so here comes grazer now left hand side And Grazer wants that fishing spot. You can see her her ears are up, her head is high. Uh, her former cub is acting quite defensive. Doesn't really have anywhere to go though. And then eventually 
grazer shoves it off of the lip of Brooks Falls. And that's not the first time we've seen mother bears act slightly aggressive towards um, their former offspring, Naomi. Yeah, I mean, that's such a clear example. I mean, and that cub was ready to be defensive. Um, and I've seen her do that with other litters, um, coming off the falls platform and um, seeing uh, 903 run by and then Grazer running right after him. So yeah, this is a, a, a different view. Um, bears are individuals. They're also really intelligent and they can remember each other across seasons and years. So I have no doubt that Grazer knows that's one of her former kids on the lip of the falls. Uh, but mother bears often, especially in the first few years of sep after separation, mother bears often reinforce that separation, it seems, um, by chasing their former cubs away. Holly, we've seen her, her do that earlier this year. That's my best guess on why my, maybe mother bears will act this way towards their cubs. You know, last year it was like Grazer will defend her cubs nearly to the death if she had to. But this year it's like, hey, kid, I told you you're on your own, you know, now you need to you need to scram. I want to fish here. So, yeah, this was, I think, a, an interesting interaction between a mother and her um, and her former cub that happened, I think, just a couple of hours before we went live here. Let's head back to the live footage at Brooks Falls. So still that same bear on the lip of the waterfall, slowly catching fish. Um, if we go to our main falls camera, yeah, A56 uh, on the left-hand side. And I think you're right, uh, Naomi. I think I was mistaken before. That does not look, from this perspective, that does not look like um, Grazer on on the far wall. The, the profile earlier in the blonde ears, I think, tricked me when that bear was in the far pool. Yeah. It's so easy to be tricked. I, I say I don't know a lot about bear IDs. And that's to be expected too, because, well, over the last 20 years, every year, there's been about 80 bears on average using um, Brooks Falls. And this is definitely clearly not Grazer. So thanks for this, um, this close up view of, of this bear. Uh, so that's a lot of bears to get to learn. A lot of them move out, um, never to be seen again. So sometimes they'll only use the river for a couple of years. Every year we get new bears moving in and using the river as well. So sometimes you're looking at a bear that hasn't been seen or identified at the river before. But there's a long-term bear monitoring study at Brooks River. And through that study, bears are assigned ID numbers. Photographs are taken of the bears. So we know a lot about these individual bears. And then the hive mind of the webcam audience helps us to better understand their behavior as well, because people are watching all of the time versus when, you know, I have to go to bed or something like that. And I'm not watching on uh, 24 seven. So yeah, thanks to everybody who collects yeah. that information and shares it around. Cause it definitely helps us learn more about the behavior of the animals. Oh, I rely on the bear cam viewers a lot and that wiki and the hive mind. And I will say one thing, this is not Otis. No, definitely not. Too small, ears aren't right. Definitely a much younger bear. Not as well filled in either as um, as Grazer, who I was talking about before. Taking its chances against the far wall in the vicinity of 856. But again, today's a, today's a day when there's lots of salmon available and bears, I think, are less aggressive towards one another when they have ample food. So there's no reason really to fight uh, when you don't have to compete over a resource. Mike, Maybe does this is that back wall give Oh, I just have a question. Does that back wall sure. give uh, bears there a bit of um, security and safety? They don't have to watch their back, so to speak? I think so, for some bears, for sure. Um, their, their, their hindquarters are places where we see them with sometimes big wounds. So if a bear catches them off guard, 
either by surprise or in a fight. Um, the claws can do a lot of damage to those hindquarters. So you don't want to really leave that exposed. Um, and we see that with in, in interactions between bears, um, you know, maybe it's a dominant interaction, for instance, you'll see the more dominant bear turning his back or her back and walking away from um, the bear that it had just, just challenged. Uh, and I think that's basically just showcasing, like, I'm not afraid of you, and I don't think you're going to do anything about it. Uh, so right. bears want to protect their flanks as, as best they can. Um, so they, yeah, maybe don't want to leave those areas exposed. I, I just have to say, uh, the cam ops are doing an amazing job. Yeah, thanks to our volunteer camera operators uh, and our volunteer moderators who help make uh, Explore.org experience um, so good. Um, you know, the viewing experience is, in a sense, curated by our, our camera operators uh, because um, these cameras are remotely controlled. So there's no artificial intelligence or machine learning right now that is following the bears. It's a person that's logged into the cameras remotely who's driving them at, at um, this point in time. Now, may I take a guess? Is that Sarah again? Or is it 717? Yeah, that looks like 717 to me on the right side um, in the foreground, right, or in the middle ground, right at, at center right. So 717, a small adult female. We've never seen her with cubs, even though she is an adult. I think she was born in 2014 or so. We don't know that for sure. We suspect that she was. But yeah, um, she's a small adult female. She doesn't seem to, Naomi, she's one of those bears, and you've seen her in person too. She, She's one of those bears that's not really like assertive. Like you're not going to see her shoving her in between like three or four bears in the lip of the falls or in the far pool or something like that. She's maybe a bit more timid in that sense, waiting for scraps, looking for things that can't swim away. Maybe that's why she's not, not very and big. Got it. Um, yeah, but um, you know, that well, strategy can nice, pay off. Nice size. Yeah. I mean, not all bears can compete for those those prime fishing spots, and they find alternatives. They're very clever. They're innovative. Um, they're going to find other ways. That's one thing that they can do is they can partition themselves into different niches at Brooks Falls. Because if they all tried to fish in the same way, there would only be a few bears who would have space at the waterfalls. So not only do they learn by watching each other, um, but they also learn to utilize space that's available to them. So if their preferred fishing spot is taken by a more dominant bear, then a lot of times they'll just simply wait. And a lot of times they'll be like, you know what, maybe I'll go and I'll try a different spot. And 717 Naomi, clearly not that hungry because um, she left the, most of those fish to the gulls. <laughs> And got another one, so she's got a great strategy. Seven one seven here. Uh, this um, small adult female, high grading again, clearly looking for the fattiest parts of the fish. Bears are really good at digesting protein, so you may wonder why would they skip the rest of the fish, uh, and that's because they are their digestive system is primed to digest sugars and fat. So when you you can skip the protein and go straight to the fat, that's going to allow them to build the fat reserves quicker. And those are the fat reserves that are necessary for them to survive winter hibernation. They're also getting enough protein from the salmon to build their muscle mass at the same time. So salmon are, are really uh, a great energy source for them. And it looks like our, our live feed has frozen just for the minute. But I think this will give us an opportunity, Naomi, to talk about another, um, a mother that we have seen occasionally at the river, a mm -hmm. first-time mom. This is number 101. Have you had the opportunity to see her in person? So this is a recorded clip. I haven't seen her, no. So this is very interesting to me. 
I, I mean, yeah, I've so seen the concern about her um, in the chat. Yeah, she is. I mean, when you look at this this um, footage of her here from a few days ago. Uh, she's a small female overall. She's also quite thin at this time of the year, trying to care for those um, those two first year cubs behind her is a real challenge for her since she is a first time mom. There's a steep learning curve that first time moms experience. Uh, I can't imagine, you know, what it's like and what they must have to go through. I mean, they, they have some memory for what their mothers do, but a lot of this is just kind of like instinct and also their personal learning from their own personal experiences as they're trying to raise um, their, their offspring. And she's brought them to the falls, which is something that um, some more experienced moms don't do with their koi. And that's we, yeah one of the though, differences some between experience yeah them. yeah but the differences between mother bears um, can be where they fish with their cubs. Um, some like great grazer will take her. Her um, first year cubs to the falls. 402 often takes her first year cubs to the falls. Uh, Divot will not though. Divot's a very experienced mom. She doesn't take her cubs to the falls when they're when they're this age. So it depends. Again, it's it's back to the individuality. What they know is success successful for them. Then also how they're weighing the risk and reward. That's you know something that we talk about frequently on the cams uh, with mother bears. You can definitely see that um, 101 here a few days ago was quite skinny. It was rough for her, um, you know, the past few weeks because there were few salmon around. But I think yesterday and today she's been able to get many more meals in her stomach to help satisfy that what must be um, a, a tremendous hunger for her at this time of the year because she's still producing milk for her cubs. So let's, uh, let's head back to the falls the time being, 717 on the left here, back to live footage. If you joined us a little bit um, late in the broadcast, thanks for being here. My name is Mike Fitz with Explore.org, talking with Katmai National Park Ranger Naomi Boak about brown bears and salmon at Brooks River in Katmai National Park. And this is live footage right now, looking at uh, 717 on the left-hand side, maybe a uh, young adult male there or older subadult, um, sort of at center right. Again, look at size difference, right? How small 717 is compared to that young bear. And they are, these bears are standing not far from a wildlife viewing platform. That's where our camera is attached. And I know we had a question that came in in advance um, sort of about this. So I want to show you the um, the wildlife viewing platform from the Lip of Brooks Falls. So this is, I, I took this in May several years ago when there weren't bears around. Walked to the, You can go to the Lip of the Falls at that time of the year. It's open to people. Um, so I, I wanted to get this picture. I took it. You can see the, the falls camera on the, um, the right-hand side of that platform, sort of like that, that white dot towards the top. Um, but the question, Naomi, was about um, impact the bears. So somebody was wondering, I was watching lots of bears and I heard people talking and cheering. How close can people get there? And is it dangerous for people or disturbing uh, to the bears? Yeah, well, um, the noises can be disturbing to the bears. I don't it's not really dangerous on that platform. I mean, the bears go under it and behind it and around it. Um, I've not been there when a bear has tried to come on the platform. I mean, if they really wanted to, they probably could, but I don't, I don't think they want to. I don't think they want to be around all those people tightly packed on that platform. Um, we ask people not to cheer for the bears um, when they catch a fish, um, when we're all in one group and we're, we're, we're in a predictable place, 
the bears, they, they're aware of us. They sometimes look at us, but they tend to say, oh, okay, that's that, those two-legged things that are there and I don't have to worry about them. They're not gonna go after my fish. They're, they're just gonna stay there. Does that seem right to you, Mike? Yeah, when, when people consolidate into predictable locations and behave predictably, then bears can learn to work around us. There are bears that never get used to the presence of people. And that's why the falls platform closes at this time of the year at 10 PM Alaska time to allow bears who aren't habituated to the presence of people, the opportunity to, um, to fish without our disturbance in the area around Brooks falls right now, hundred yards upstream, hundred yards downstream, and also 50 yards in either bank. That's completely close to people at this time of the year. Um, so that also gives bears, you know, sort of a refuge in space along the river where they know they're, they're not going to experience people um, at, the, at this time of the year. Uh, so, yeah, predictability is just, I think, maybe the most important thing when you're trying to coexist with, um, or one of the most important things when you're trying to coexist with, with bears and, and other wildlife. Uh, people, you know, sometimes you'll read that bears are unpredictable, and I think that's... Um, to put it bluntly, I think that's BS. Bears are very predictable. And they will tell you basically what's on their mind if you're interacting with them, it, you, as long as we know how to read their behaviors. It's people that's unpredictable. You can think about how the, how wide ranging the reactions of people are towards bears um, it, and how hard it might be for a bear to try to read human behavior. Um, because in some situations they'll be like, oh, uh, you know, this person seems okay with my presence and it's acting quietly and it's respectful and it's up on the wildlife viewing platform. And then, you know, it walks away from there and it's in the forest and it encounters somebody on the trail or something like that who's, um, who's scared or maybe, you know, you're not supposed to run, but maybe runs or shouts at the bear or something like that. So I think people are maybe the, um, the most unpredictable element of the bear's experience um, in the Brooks River area. Yeah, I, I think that's very true. I mean, if I have a, a close encounter with a bear, the first thing I'm doing is trying to read what the bear is telling me by its movements, by um, any sounds. Um, is it going to approach me? Um, and then I'm, I'm trying to have a predictable, calm behavior, speaking to it in a calm voice, unless it does something that, that um, is I, I've, I interpret as dangerous to me, like approaching me or charging me. But they seem to understand those kinds of predictable human behaviors. Um, and, you know, we're, we're, we're unpredictable too often. And when you are at Brooks River, and I hope lots of you have the opportunity to visit um, in, in the future, um, be sure to, uh, you know, consider how your visit can impact um, the bears themselves. And that's why I like to stand on the wildlife viewing platforms, not go into the river, for instance, um, because that's where the bears need to fish. And again, if we can consolidate into predictable places and act predictably um, around the bears, then the bears have much more access to the habitats that um, they need to survive. Uh, we, we just have a few minutes left in our, our broadcast, Naomi. There's one more um, highlight from the past couple of weeks or so that I wanted to get to here before um, the end of the broadcast. And this has to do with an adoption that we've seen on Brooks River. So let's go to um, a clip of that because uh, number 909 has, or excuse me, number not, 910 has adopted her sister's two and a half year old cub. So that cub was separated earlier uh, from that, from her mother. It's just a normal time of the year for that to happen. Uh, but those families were so familiar with each other last year that the the, um, the two and a half year old has now become part of the 910 family. So 910 here fishing on the lip of the falls while that adopted two and a half year old is suckling milk. This is such an amazing family story. Um, I mean, it's just incredible that they were, that 909 and 910 were essentially together towards the end of last season and were together for a while until 909 went into estrus and left them. And now, and now there's this new family group 
Um, it, it's going to be very interesting to watch them this season and next. And also, speaking of learning from moms, they are descended from 409, a bear who was a champ at fishing on the lip. And um, all of them seem to do well on the lip. It's also created a conundrum um, between the cubs themselves. So the two and a half year old and the biological um, yearling of number nine, ten. So this is a different clip. This is, a, you know, family life isn't always, you know, hugs and kisses, right? I mean, it includes right. uh, situations where um, there's competition, there's conflict. Um, and in this this clip here, as, as it plays, we'll see um, that number nine, um, zero nine junior, as we're calling it, doesn't have a specific specific identification number right now. Um, will um, not share really any food with that um, with that yearling, nine tens yearling. So we see them, you know, moving back and forth. We see them chasing one another. Submitted in advance for our, for our, uh, our live chats. Um, and a person wrote in, it seems like 910 Junior has taken to squatting 909 Junior fairly frequently. In a period of relatively scarce resources, nine, 910 Junior re, um, perhaps resents having to share fish and milk with 909 Junior, question mark, or do the Cubs just have differing ideas about um, personal space? <laughs> that That's... um. You know, it's an interesting thought. I think it really, again, it goes down to, it comes down to food availability. Like we didn't see this sort of thing between them last year because they had access to, you know, so much salmon at the end of the summer. But early in the summer this year, not as many fish available to them. And they're just, I think they're just hungrier. So I think it's, it's if, if salmon were more available, then we would see these bears not competing with each other within that family as vigorously as we're seeing. Um, so far this year. Yeah, I, I think that's true. And I think uh, we'll watch later in the season, although later in the season, um, when they're fishing in the lower river for dead and dying salmon, um, we may still see competition because the cubs are in hyperphagia. And there's always a lot of competition between cubs at that point. So um, We'll see. Maybe after filling up on some salmon in the next month, it'll be uh, easier on both of them. And as we uh, come to the conclusion of our broadcast here, beautiful view of a bear scavenging salmon in the lower Brooks River. So this is our River Watch camera. After we conclude the broadcast, if you want to watch this bear or any of our our, our bear cams, again, head over to explode.org slash bears and you can find our full live cam lineup there. It's a, it seems like a time of the year, Naomi, where um, salmon are finally coming in thick and it's satisfying the bears, uh, what seems like almost insatiable hunger. What are you looking forward to seeing um, during the next week? Well, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing uh, how, how sated these uh, bears get and um, hopefully more salmon and I'm also interested in seeing how the hierarchy plays out because it's it's different this year and um, let's see if those two bears at the top stay there um, when there's more salmon around. Lots of storylines yet to be um, concluded this summer. So yeah, tune into the cams, join the conversation in the comments. Let us know what you see and, and pay attention to how the bears are, are changing their behaviors to, depending on the availability of fish, how they satisfy that hunger. Each one of them is going to be doing it in a different way. And it's one of the things that makes watching the bear cams, uh, I think, so interesting. Naomi, thanks so much for joining me today. It's been a, a fun conversation and um, I look forward to having more play-by-plays with you uh, this summer. Same here. My name is Mike Fitz with explore.org. My co-host for the play-by-play -play today was Katmai National Park Ranger Naomi Boak. We'll be back with another play-by-play, -play, uh, same bear time, same bear channel next week. So 7 p.m. Eastern time, 3 p.m. if you are in Alaska on Thursdays. Have a great day, everybody. And until we see you again, enjoy the bears.